I want to conclude our study in the book of Ephesians. We've been going through this book for quite a while. I want to just encapsulate it in this final message. And uh, I want us to hone in on one final thought. And it's perhaps the most important. Maybe it's something that uh, uh, we kind of all know, but we never really uh, give the attention that it needs. So after Paul tells us to stand firm... Right? Last week we talked about this. Remember he said we need to put on the full armor of God. What does he say? He says these words in verse 18 of chapter 6. He says, With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Now, he finishes it off in the context of a passage talking about spiritual warfare, and he says that we need to pray. You know, as Christians, we understand something. If we're aware, we realize that we're at war. And our enemy is all around us, right? He's waging war to defeat us in our walk with Christ, and uh, it's an all-out struggle. And the enemy is very real. This is not imagined. So knowing this, our view of the Christian life should change dramatically. When we go through the Christian life, it's not a walk through the daisies. It's not a playground. It's a battleground. And Paul knew that the uh, only way to win a battle of such a magnitude against these spiritual forces was to employ supernatural equipment. So we got into that, right? We talked about all the armor of God. He urged them Last week, we talked about putting on the full armor of God. But you ask yourself as you're sitting there, how? How do I put on this armor? I mean, it's not like it's physical, right? And the easy answer is found in that next, very next verse is by prayer. The way we put on supernatural armor is by relentless prayer. And I want you to really focus on that word relentless. This is something that should be constantly at the forefront of our Christian lives. He tells them to pray and petition God, what? At all times. I mean, the enemy could strike at any time. So why wouldn't we want to be constantly putting on the armor through prayer, every piece of this armor, at all times? He also goes on and he says to do it with what? With all perseverance. All perseverance, all times, all perseverance. P to persevere, to keep going. Don't just pray for a little while and, and then just whimper out. Prayer is the single greatest force on earth. And it's the greatest force that has ever been unleashed in this world. It's the single most powerful weapon that we have as believers to be armored by God through prayer. There's an old hymn. You've sung this hymn. I love this one. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. Don't trust yourself. Put on the gospel armor. Each piece put on with prayer where duty calls or danger be never wanting there. You catch that line? Put each piece of that armor on with prayer. So you've been given armor. You've been given a tremendous amount of protection. It's all that you need to withstand the enemy's attacks. It's your key to victory. You want to have victory in the Christian life? You need to put on this armor in the midst of your spiritual warfare. God tells you to put it on. Now I, want to, I want you to, you probably having a hard time wrapping your arms around this. It's just so simple. See this? This is a regulation bulletproof vest. Now I want to put on the bulletproof vest I don't know if you guys are not happy with my message, so I just might want to put this on here. You might not like it, but why do police officers wear a bulletproof vest? Because they want to protect themselves. Now, it doesn't cover everything. In fact, I kind of, if I was a police officer, I might have a bulletproof body armor like from head to toe and walk around but I know that it's not comfortable. But this is at least covering very important vital organs, isn't it? And the bulletproof vest is something that has saved many lives. And uh, if you're a little bit, uh, oh, I don't know, risky, you might not wear it to work one day. But I wouldn't want to do that. But you see, the problem is 
is that when we're talking about spiritual warfare, these spiritual arrows that are being aimed at us, they're different in nature. And so how do you put on spiritual armor? This is something we could relate to. Okay, I'm going to put on a, a bulletproof vest. It'll protect me against a large caliber weapon, right? And that's great to have. But there's a passage in Mark um, I want us to look at, and uh, I just want us to think about this. But this concept is, is so simple that almost it's too simple. And I think sometimes we don't appreciate that God simply wants us to trust him. There's something amazing and powerful about prayer. When we pray, we are calling on all of the resources of heaven to our aid. When we, when we do that, then we're unstoppable. It says in James, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Do you believe that? That it avails? That I mean... Do we really believe that it's worthwhile to invest time in praying? I think for many of us, good Christians, but for many of us, prayer has become perfunctory. It's an act that we do, but with very little fervency. I think that when we're talking about prayer, warfare praying, we're talking about ferocious praying. We're talking about being fierce in your prayer, relentless prayers. We're talking about calling upon the armies of heaven. I wonder where the church would be if we truly became people of prayer. I mean, I'm talking about having intense, aggressive praying. That's the kind of prayer that shakes the forces of darkness, that gets them nervous and starts to have them scatter. Let me talk for just a moment. How many of you have fasted recently? Just for a moment, just kind of think about it. How serious are you about prayer? When I fast, that's an opportunity for me to focus more attention on prayer. When we fast, it's, it's setting aside our physical needs, such as food, to seek after God. That's what fasting is all about. It's not just to deprive ourselves. Fasting is a practice that will help give us clear thinking as God speaks to us without all the other distractions. We're not just fasting to, to try to show our, our religiosity, uh, but to listen to the voice of God. I can tell you that fasting is a wonderful way to humble us before our maker. There's a, a passage in Mark about a difficult, uncooperative demon. There's demons out there. There are evil spirits out there. And there was one in the, in the book of Mark and the disciples came across this little boy that had possessed his, this little boy, the, the, demon, the demons, and the distraught father, he said, you know, I told the disciples to cast it out, but they couldn't do it. The disciples were trying to cast out this demon. And if you look in Mark chapter 9, verse 22, let me read it for you. It says here, it says here, it, it, the evil spirit, it, has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help him. Help us. So he's, he's calling out, he's talking to Jesus. He said, this evil spirit has possessed my son. He actually literally throws him into the fire. And he's trying to kill him. He's trying to destroy him. This is a terrible situation. And Jesus answers him. He says, if... You can do anything. And Jesus said to him, if, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. So there's a component in prayer. There's a component in our Christian lives about faith. Faith makes everything possible. When we trust and we really believe that God can affect something by our prayers. So Jesus proceeds to free the boy. He exercises the demon. And then the disciples came up to him and they said, well, why couldn't we do that? I mean, we, we went and tried to do that. Why couldn't we do that? And look what it says here in Mark chapter 9, verse 29, a few verses down. He said to them, this kind, this kind that you're doing of, of you know, performance cannot come out by anything but prayer. You want to you wanna exercise a demon? Well, there are some things that can only be accomplished by prayer. 
How many things do we attempt for God in our own strength? And um, I can be sure of this after reading this passage. There are some things, according to Jesus, that will only come about by prayer. If you look in the King James, they add two words. I guess it wasn't in the better manuscripts, but they said prayer and fasting. Maybe they just wanted to show the emphasis of the intensity of prayer, but the whole point is still the same. We need to pray. So we need to make that our new occupation. As you leave the book of Ephesians, you're going to continue to study other books, but throughout your life, they could take away your Bible one day, but they can't take away your ability to call out to God. We need to resist the urge to set prayer on the side. We need not to do like the disciples in the garden. Instead, we need to watch and pray. We need to be praying constantly. That's what is our strength. When we are in constant communication with the master general. Philippians 4, 6 says, be anxious for nothing. Any of you anxious today? <laughs> I bet. Be anxious for nothing, but instead, instead, but in everything, I mean everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. That, my friends, is a recipe for a contented life. When we can leave our cares and our worries in the hands of a God who is bigger than us. So let's pull this all together as we kind of leave this place of the book of Ephesians. As we said last week, God promises that if we put on the full armor, if we do that, he's going to provide what we need. We will be able to stand firm regardless of the threats. If we have the equipment that we've been given, we can be assured that we're going to be victorious against Satan's attacks. And it's interesting, there are different kinds of armor that we read about. Some of the armor is defensive armor. Sometimes we're, we're going to be attacked, right? The breastplate that we talked about, like that bulletproof vest, it protects us from serious wounds. Uh, we have the shield that deflects the arrows of the enemy. But there's an offensive weapon too, and that's the sword, the sword of the spirit. With a sword, we don't just deflect the arrows, but we can strike down the one who's shooting those arrows. Isn't this a wonderful thing to know that God has called us into battle to go fight head-on the enemy? There are times when you need to be in a defensive posture. You're being attacked hard, and you put on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation. You anchor yourselves with the shoes of the gospel. You're, you're in that battle stance. You're standing firm. But we're not just trying to survive, folks. That's not the point of the church. We're, we're not just trying to save our own skin. We also need to go on the offensive. We need to secure a victory for other people that are being attacked like that little boy, right? We need to storm the gates of hell and sometimes the, get the devil running in, in the opposite direction. We need to move in on the enemy strongholds. Jesus told us to do that. He said, go, go into all the world. He didn't say merely hunker down in your spiritual foxholes. He said, I want you to go. I want you to invade enemy territory. What do you think is going to happen if you bring the gospel into hospital places that are not sympathetic of the gospel? There are going to be opposition that you're going to face. And he says, as you go, you need to carry the sword of the truth of the living word of God this is your authority. You're not going in your own power or in your own authority. You're going in the strength and the power of God. When we proclaim Jesus, we are proclaiming the gospel of the grace of God that's been offered to all men, and it's the only way to get to heaven. So we can go with confidence. When those people up there gave their testimonies, they talked about this wonderful revolution that occurred in their heart when they were once lost, but now they're found. It's the only hope for the world, folks. And we have it. The message is authenticated in God's word. His promises are recorded. And this revelation is to us. And it's our authority. So we can go in authority, not in our authority, but in God's authority, 
So when we share the good news, when we show the scriptures that he is the only way, it, it can penetrate even the hardest of hearts. The people you think would be the least likely to respond to Jesus will respond when we go with the sword. It says in Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and it's able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The word of God is like a sword, right? And it pierces And then he, he finally says we need to take every thought captive to the obedience or the lordship of Christ. Everything you put in your mind needs to be held captive to obedience to the lordship of Christ. In other words, we should only entertain those thoughts and embrace only those things that are in alignment with the mind of Christ. We spend way too much time entertaining thoughts that are so antithetical to what God thinks, to the heart of God. And then we wonder why we get deceived. And then we wonder why we fall to temptation. Romans 12, 2 says we need to be transformed, how? By the renewing of our mind. It's the mind, right? We need the mind of Christ. If we fail to know the mind of Christ, which we find here, then we give Satan an opportunity to confuse us and distract us and discourage us. But again, how? I believe, I believe the way we start to do this is we need to pray differently. 
And as we close, I just want you to think about this. We need to start praying the right kind of prayers. We need to start praying things like, Lord, give me wisdom so that I can spot all of these lies. Lord, give me wisdom. You think God is not going to give you wisdom? He says if, that's a promise of God in James, right? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives it. He'll give it to you abundantly. He will give you what you need. I think we need to pray for God's strength when we're tempted. When you feel the temptation to do something wrong, start praying. And here's a little, a little secret. Don't stop praying until the temptation is completely passed. Like, oh, Lord, help me not to look over there. Help me not to look over there. Oh, wait, I'll look over there. And you stop praying. you got to keep praying until that, that visual that you don't want to look at is gone. That's how you overcome you got to ask for God to give you the strength. you got to believe God for the strength. When we dabble with sin, we make ourselves vulnerable to being shipwrecked completely and defeated. You just play around a little bit with the sin, you know? You think you can play with the fire without being burned. That mentality is extremely dangerous. Extremely dangerous. We need to start praying for things to happen in our lives. Why don't we start praying, God, open the eyes of the people around me that are blind so that I can share the gospel. Give me open doors, Lord. Give me open opportunities. We should be praying, God, let me have a way to witness to this person. Could you work in him, convict him, do whatever you have to. Give, give me wisdom to say the right thing. Give me the words to say, Lord. These are the kind of praying, the warfare praying. We're praying that God would give us what we need to live the Christian life. We need to start praying also for others. You're praying for yourself. That's great. That's petition, calling upon God. But there's something about intercession. Paul knew the value of that. Paul asked for prayer all the time, right? God listens when we pray. He hears us. He promised that. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We can pray and say, God, do this wonderful thing in this person's life. If you know it's God's will for them... This is something wonderful, Lord. Bless them. You can pray for someone. Look what it says in verse 19 of Ephesians 6. And pray on my behalf. This is Paul. He's asking for it. Pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in change, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Do you think Paul was successful because Paul was such a great guy, he was a very unassuming guy. You know why Paul changed the world? You know why I believe Paul revolutionized and turned the world upside down? Perhaps the greatest model for us of the Christian life is the Apostle Paul. It would be very hard-pressed to find someone in the Bible that made more of an impact than Paul himself. But it wasn't just Paul. I believe the reason Paul was so bold and so relentless in the proclamation of the gospel is he had an army of Christians that took prayer seriously. And they were praying for him intensely, relentless prayer for his ministry. And because of that, that's why Paul changed the world. So we need to start praying that we as a body can reach this world that we have, that we're living in today. Because today, the world needs Jesus. And we have the answers. Uh, it's the only hope. It's the only hope. And faith in this wonderful work, it's what saves us, it's what protects us, and it accesses supernatural power in our life. I'll tell you, if you don't know this, Jesus, I want you to know. Him. As we pray right now, I want you to think about something. It says in Romans 4, 5, it's a wonderful verse, right? Everybody know it is verse? But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited for righteousness. Can you trust him? Yeah, of course you can. You, you, you're, you are Christians, you know, you've, you've learned you can trust him. But maybe you've never trusted Jesus. Today, why don't you trust him? Today, you can say to him, I'm putting my faith and trust in you alone, God. And I know you're trustworthy, and you're my only hope. And I'm putting in, in my faith in you to save me. Not in my good works. It says in that passage, 
The one who does not work but believes is justified. So, Lord, I'm not going to try anymore to, uh, to reach your standard because it's impossible. I'm not going to try to show you my merit because it's not good enough. I'm simply going to believe in what you did on the cross to give me my righteousness. Like, like, like Todd said. Todd said what? He said that he, he got Christ's righteousness. He tried to, in his own righteousness, he couldn't do it, and he got Christ's righteousness. Don't you want Christ's righteousness given to you? Put your faith in him today. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Your wonderful, glorious um, word says that we can have boldness and confidence about the future. And I pray, Lord, that we would walk into the battle with confidence, knowing that we have your armor that we have your spirit inside of us and that we can be victorious. Lord, I pray for that in Christ's name.